Man refuses to sell his home, so his rich neighbor tries another tactic. To say that Charles Crocker was irritated by his neighbor, Nicholas Young, was a massive understatement. A rich railroad tycoon, Crocker wanted to buy up all of the residential space in the area, but Young refused every offer that came his way. So Crocker, who was not one to take no for an answer, dreamed up the pettiest scheme to get his way, which created one of the most bizarre neighborhood disputes in history. Things weren't at all easy for Nicholas Young when he immigrated to the United States from Germany in 1848, but that didn't stop him from working hard to eventually carve out a decent life for himself. Young, who relocated overseas to San Francisco with his wife Rosina, worked his way up to owning a lucrative mortuary. With the money he raked in, he and Rosina looked to purchase their first home. They settled on a lot located at San Francisco's scenic California Street Hill. The money from the mortuary in no way allowed them to live like a Rockefeller, but they were able to snag an adorable cottage. It wasn't huge, but for Young and his wife, it was perfect. They also had a garden in the front that Rosina tended to daily, ensuring that California Street Hill spot was as comfortable as possible. But then Charles Crocker showed up. All of Young's comfort came to a screeching halt when Crocker set his eyes on California Street Hill. The wealthy businessman was ready to take charge and force anything in his way out of the picture. Crocker grew his fat bank account through lucrative investments he made during the construction of the Central Pacific Railroad. As one of the big four barons, his wealth afforded him anything he wanted, and what he wanted to do was lord over San Francisco like a gargoyle, controlling whatever it was that displeased him. He was also joined by some of his wealthy associates as well. At the same time, the other men who invested in the Central Pacific Railroad, along with Crocker, are all pompous and arrogant magnates ready to take over land wherever they settled. It was actually one of Crocker's friends who suggested California Street Hill. The former governor of California and the eventual founder of Stanford University, Leland Stanford, was the one who made the push for California Street Hill. Seeing the opportunity as wise, Crocker and others took the leap. Stanford funded a cable car so residents didn't have to schlep up and down the massive hill every day. Once it was installed, it seemed like every day a new lot on the street was snatched up by someone rich. Crocker himself had an absurdly enormous 12,000 square foot mansion erected. He wanted everyone to know just how powerful he was. After nearly all the homes were bought up, California renamed the area Knob Hill. It seemed like everything was going according to the Big Four's plans, seeing as they owned nearly every residential building on the street. However, there was one sore spot Crocker soon recognized. Nicholas Young was still living in his cottage, and he refused to sell his land to anyone willing to buy it. This left Crocker furious, but the railroad baron was willing to offer Young a large sum of money. There are different accounts on exactly what went down, but what is known is that Crocker kept offering larger sums of money only to have Young turn it all down. So Crocker resorted to the pettiest solution possible. Seeing as Young wouldn't budge, Crocker legally installed a 40-foot tall fence around Young's lot leaving the couple in darkness. However, once the Working Men's Party of California found out about Crocker's bullying, they stepped in. Not only did they condemn Crocker for his spite fence, but he was also under fire for working Chinese immigrants tirelessly. Crocker still didn't take down the fence, and not long after the protest, Young and Rosina vacated the property. It looked like Crocker had won. However, just because the Youngs left didn't mean they sold the land off. Even after Nicholas died in 1880, Rosina stood firm until her death in 1902. Crocker's descendants finally got the land. He won. But that didn't last. The San Francisco earthquake that rocked the city in 1906 completely destroyed most of Knob Hill. After the disaster, Crocker's family didn't even bother rebuilding, and they donated the land to charity instead. Funny enough, the land that once played host to one of the most petty neighborhood disputes of all time saw the construction of the Grace Cathedral years later, a very interesting contrast to what once existed in its place. Crocker's spite fence power move was certainly over the top, but then again, the trolley men didn't take their vengeful architectural escapades anywhere near to the level that others during the same era did. Just a few miles away from Young and Crocker, Sarah Winchester was constructing something so formidable 
and haunting that not only did it cause her to be completely outcasted by society, but decades later her bizarre creation still attracts thousands of curious visitors from all around the world. Back before there were ghosts and mansions, Sarah fell madly in love with a wealthy man, William Winchester, but wealth was never her concern. Many who were close to the couple recall a genuinely loving relationship, making their tragedy all the more dismal. At the time, Sarah's last name was Party, and she wanted nothing more than to be Mrs. Winchester. Despite her love for the suave, bearded businessman, Sarah was unsettled by the source of Winchester's enormous wealth. William Winchester was the second owner of the Winchester Rifle Company. At first, Sarah thought nothing of it, since Winchester's earnings were hefty and consistent. However, reality struck when Sarah saw one particular product in action. Winchester's father, Oliver, had founded the company in 1866, and much of his fortune came from the success of the Winchester repeating rifle. Once Sarah understood how this weapon worked, her stance changed completely. With the ability to shoot multiple rounds in a matter of seconds, the repeating rifle frightened Sarah. She began to feel guilty about becoming a Winchester. When she found out she was pregnant, she thought her child's success would make up for these guilty feelings. Unfortunately, her reality was far more gruesome. Six weeks after the birth of their child, the newly married Winchesters were struck with heartbreak. Their baby daughter Annie contracted marasmus, a disorder preventing her body from digesting food. After little Annie passed away, Sarah became enthralled with superstitions. Sarah blamed the ghosts of those murdered by the Winchester rifles for the tragic loss of her child, but Winchester, tasked with running his father's business, had no time to humor such ridiculous claims. Soon, tragedy struck again. Not long after the death of her only daughter, Sarah had to say goodbye to her one true love. Mr. Winchester passed away from tuberculosis in 1881, leaving Sarah widowed and devastated. However, there was one perk to her wealthy husband's death. Sarah's guilt only mounted when Mr. Winchester's entire fortune landed in her lap. She received a sum that today amounts to over $500 million. She vowed to use it against this evil omen sabotaging her life. How? For that, she needed to ask her dead husband himself. During the trendy rise of spiritualism in the United States, many people paid big to speak with dead relatives and loved ones. Sarah was among them, dishing out hundreds for a genuine medium. The message Sarah received would end up consuming her life. Sarah's expensive medium claimed to speak with Mr. Winchester, who had a cunning plan to fool those wretched ghosts. Clearly, Sarah thought becoming a ghost himself had swayed Mr. Winchester into believing in the supernatural. His idea would require a large sum of Sarah's inherited fortune. First, Mr. Winchester wanted Sarah to move out west, which she did with haste. There, he told her to find a plot of land with plenty of room to build. Upon arriving in San Jose, California, Sarah purchased a farmhouse that was mid-construction. Under her husband's orders, Sarah began constructing her ghost-catching mansion. Not a single architect was willing to meet Sarah's demands. They insisted her suggestions would cause serious injury, but Sarah knew this mansion was for spirits, not people. Frustrated, she decided to lead the construction all by herself. Sarah gathered dozens of local construction workers and commenced the project. Her workers were rumored to be on site day and night, through weekends and on holidays. Seeking perfection, Sarah paid her crew handsomely. Eventually, her vision began to piece together. Sarah hired multiple mediums to help her speak with the dead. With their guidance, she instructed workers to build grand staircases that expanded up several flights before ending abruptly. They wallpapered long, dead-end hallways and installed meaningless doors. As time went on, Sarah's additions became more and more baffling. In an attempt to expand quickly, Sarah had extensions tacked onto existing rooms. She became less picky about exact measurements, causing some fixtures to be Frankenstein together. Her home had become a hazardous funhouse, but she had to keep going. Sarah had begun construction in 1884. 
20 years later, her mansion had reached seven stories high. It had 161 rooms, two ballrooms, three elevators, two basements, 47 fireplaces, 17 chimneys, and one working restroom. Once again, Sarah was in love. Unfortunately, she was about to be met with another heart-wrenching tragedy. In 1906, California was hit with a devastating 7.9 magnitude earthquake. It remains one of America's deadliest natural disasters, destroying 80% of San Francisco and the surrounding areas. As a result, Sarah's haphazard seven-story mansion splintered and toppled to the ground. Sarah was in ruins. Was this a sign to halt construction? Luckily, Sarah had given the mansion a floating foundation, commonly found in earthquake-prone parts of the world. This prevented the mansion from total collapse. However, Sarah's strange construction did cause a large portion of the damage. Her plan? Build it again, but better. Sarah settled for a four-story mansion and spent another 20 years rebuilding the property. Forever beholden to Mr. Winchester, Sarah lived in the mansion until her death in 1922. It's easy to say she was just a widow in mourning, but her determination to appease spirits resulted in a spectacular work of art. 